So Matt, do you just kind of want to go over your introduction to Christian and what his life kind of leading up to this point existed within the bounds of? I can do that or you can just you can just have him kind of introduce himself and he can he can share his story. It's kind of the angle that we go for normally. Okay. So Christian, let's talk about your first introduction to racing. I mean, you said at age 10, you kind of got into the Daytona experience, but was there one thing about that period of your life that drew you to racing specifically? Honestly, when I was a kid, we had a uh, Jeff Gordon remote in the house. And for some reason, I, I picked that remote up and, and loved it and found it on TV one day. And for some reason, that, that just turned into my love for the sport. And, and I watched it every weekend, week out, and I begged my parents to take me to the Speedway. And finally, around age 10, they took me to the track. And I, I was able to sneak my way into the garage and meet a lot of my heroes and, and meeting Jeff Gordon and, and Junior and, and a lot of these guys that are the top competitors of, of NASCAR. So... Honestly, it's crazy. A remote probably jump started it, but that's what we had in the house, and that's what got me rolling in the race. So let's talk about sneaking into a Daytona garage. How did that happen, and why was <clears> that? <throat> I mean, like, how did how did you, as a ten year old, sneak into <laughs> a professional racing garage? Yeah, I um. So they had fan zone tickets. So a fan zone ticket would allow you down on the infield, but it would not give you garage access garage access so basically you could see the drivers you could see them walking through but you had to buy a specific pass to, which is called a hot pass or a cold pass at the time to get into that garage area so i went to where the media center was knowing where the drivers were going in and i just saw that there was no security guard sitting at that gate and i decided to walk right in that gate and i had my head down and as i was walking into that gate i was like man this is working and i just kept my head down and once i got past and got into a little bit of the crowd i was like wow this actually works so I actually got kicked out after that. I, I walked up. I was like, can I walk on a pit road? And the, and the security guard was like, can I see your hot pass? So I was like, I showed him my fans. And he's like, that's not a hot pass. And he kicked me out. So I walked right back around to where I knew that security road was it was and walked right back in. So I knew not to go back towards pit road, but that's how that kind of came about. So you're from Martinsburg. How did you get into racing in the first place? um are you so are you asking like how did my story start with the yeah, actual yeah. driving so process? like yeah. how did how did you actually get into the industry right so once we went to daytona that year at 10 i continued to go to daytona um every year for the july race and that used to run on fourth of july every year so we would make a full family vacation out of going to daytona the mom and dad and katie who weren't race fans they would all end up on the beach and that would be at the racetrack um so as i figured out how to get hot passes and get in the garage the right way. Um, I met somebody, uh, his name was BJ McLeod and, and his crew members basically gave me an opportunity to come out and drive their race car. So I, I got so excited. I came back to mom. I'm like, Hey, this is, this is the opportunity. This is what I've been waiting for. This is going to be awesome. And mom was like, you're going to finish college out. You're going to go get a degree. You're not going to do this. We're going to stick with baseball. So stuck with baseball. And then we're sitting on the couch in the summer of 2018 and we're watching a race. I'm like, mom, you know, baseball, I, I feel like I had a pretty successful career getting to play at the division one level but if racing would have been an opportunity I think that would have planned out and worked out for me better and she was like you know what call BJ back and see if that opportunity is still there on the table I did and we showed up at Hickory Mirror Speedway it was my first time ever in a race car in a super late model um, and they brought Matt Tipped out who was I believe fifth in the points at the time in the Xfinity series and we he shook the car down and we ran, I think, four or five tenths off his time. It was my first time ever in a car. And they were basically like, this is supposed to be just so you had fun, but OK, you can drive a little bit. So let's go see what you can do with it. So that's pretty so much how it worked out. Let's take a step back and talk about your recruiting process for collegiate baseball, because University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I mean, how did you how did you end up there? And yeah, consequently, how did you? leave in lieu of racing right so I had a pitching coach um, that I got connected with in the Martinsburg area he's out of Clear Spring Maryland his name is Mark Shives and I got up there and started working with him um, I want to say my sophomore year of high school and he developed me he basically I showed up and I had my shoulder was shot and he told my mom I was injured so we went and got it looked at and I had a really fatigued right shoulder so he took me from throwing overhand and took me to throwing submarine style. Um, and that's kind of 
where we built that up through sophomore year of high school into going to HEC Community College for two years. He was like, you can probably go to HEC for two years, build, build a resume, and then we can probably go somewhere. Well, it turns out after my freshman year, I had knee surgery. I couldn't really perform my sophomore year, and they let me go my sophomore year. I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. So Mark was like, you know what, let's make a plan. And, and I sat down. I was like, you know, Division One's really where I want to be. And he's like, well, you're going to have to go walk, some, walk on somewhere. And we circled the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and I ended up with no, no offers, no, no recruiting offers whatsoever. And we walked, I went down there and threw the best bullpen of my life. And basically, they brought out four or five of the hitters, the three, four, five hitters. And I basically um, showed I can pitch at that level. And the coach pulled me aside. I was like, we're going to put you on the team. So, so let's talk about up. let's talk about your baseball experience. I mean, you're a relief pitcher and a consistent mm -hmm. one at that. So how did the psychology of baseball work with that kind of experience? <clears throat> because you weren't a highly touted recruit. Right. But they obviously believed in you to close. So how, right. did, how did that kind of sports psychology focus factor get seated in you so early? Honestly, the beat in my head from Mark Shives and, and a lot of pitching coaches and the foundation I had built around me. Um, they mentally prepared me, I think, more than anything. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you about the couple coaches I had at Maryland Nation Shore that to this day, they're still role models for me because of that. But Mark, basically, everybody teaches you that baseball is a sport of failure, right? So you fail seven out of 10 times in, in the big leagues and you're in the Hall of Fame. So it really teaches you, I think, a lot of things about life, a lot of aspects about all kinds of stuff that failure is acceptable. It's going to happen. It's what you do in those moments and how you prepare to come back from those moments is really the, what defines you from anybody else. And that's what separates good baseball players from great baseball players or, or any other sport is, is everybody fails. I don't care who you are. You, you find a way to fail and you should be excited about the failure. That's, that's one of the things that I, I've taken in the racing world because life is not this game that everything's going to go your way. So if you can find a way to persevere through the, the hard moments, then the, the reward at the end of that's going to be way better or greater. So that's kind of where from a release standpoint that, got something put into me is like, you know what, you got, you're going to have to be tough. You're going to be strong out here. You haven't pitched this level before you're going to face batters that are way more talented than you've ever faced in your career. Like we played schools like Duke, Pittsburgh, Georgetown. And, and honestly, knowing that I can go out there and just do the best I can. And if I fail, it's okay. And what can I do to prepare to come back and be better from that? So that is starkly in opposition of what you do now, because you can't fail now. Right. It's a very different, different aspect because I tell everybody the difference between baseball and racing is if you give a home run up, you get the baseball back and you need to go back to work. You make a mistake on the racetrack, one mistake, you slam the fence, the car is destroyed and, and your night's over. So it's a very um, different process in racing. Um, I still think failure is a huge part of it because even if you look at the top drivers on the cup series, Kyle Larson's won five times this year. They've run 27 races through last night. He's won five out of 27. So I'm, I'm not the best at math. Somebody can do the calculating there and tell you what the percentage is there. If I had a calculator, I would, but the, the odds of winning a race are very difficult at, at any level, whether it's late models, ARCA series and through the ranks, you know, there's 40 cars out there on any given night to go out there and win the race. So it's uh, still the aspect of understanding that you're not going to win every time. And it's what can you do? You have a car you know, sometimes you know that you're going to do really well and then you have you, the car is not set up the way it needs to be sometimes and you struggle and it's finding a way to make the best of that situation and get the most points and max out for those opportunities. So in August 2018, when you signed for the first time with mm -hmm. a company that was going to sponsor you, what did they say? I mean, how did they approach you? So it was a family friend that had a huge company out of um, Rockville, Maryland. And we um, went down to Ocean City, Maryland, and we basically sat down in his um, ocean condo. He, he asked me what my dreams and aspirations were. And I, I tell anybody, you know, when, when I started racing, I don't think if you have high goals, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So I, I told him my goal is to be a Cup Series champion one day. And um, I think that kind of took him by surprise. It takes everybody by surprise when I say, I don't have the experience. I haven't done this my whole life. I didn't start in go-karts when I was five years old. 
but that's my goal and, and whatever it's going to take to do that, that's what we're going to try to figure out how to do. So um, I think he really, really liked the enthusiasm and the passion I showed for the sport. We took him to Dover. We showed him around the racetrack, showed him what the opportunity looked like down the road. And um, he bought into us and, and paid for me to go race speed weeks in Daytona um, in 2019. So then in 2019, when you were on the other side of the Daytona racetrack, was that kind of a grounding experience for you? Did you just kind of sit back and say, I used to be a little kid trying to sneak in and now they let me in. Right. Yeah. To um, be here. So I haven't got the race on the Daytona International Speedway yet. And that's an opportunity. I think that's going to come here in the next year or two, hopefully with, with sponsorship opportunities. But I got the race in New Smyrna and I've got the race with a lot of my idols. I've, I've got to see a lot of the people that I grew up watching and and I interact with a lot of those people in the Charlotte area now. So the experience of going from a fan to somebody who's actually doing it was definitely a different experience, I would say. But it's um, gratifying. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And, and honestly, if you would have told me three, four years ago that this is where I would be at, I would have laughed at you. There's no way I would have thought this is where we'd be. So, so when you were leaving baseball and you said to your parents, I want to race. What did they say? Mom was um, very encouraging. I, I kind of was blown away on how encouraging she was on it. And racing, for anybody who doesn't know, is a very, very expensive sport. So it's um, you either have to have sponsors or know somebody that, you know, can help you out a lot because that's, that's ultimately what it takes nowadays to, to be a good race car driver because you have to be on the track a lot. So um, she was very encouraging. She's helped me a ton through my career financially and, you know, mentally and, and being able to allow me to do this. And I'm very grateful for that. And, and there's, I can go through a whole list of people already. You know, I listened to Jeff Gordon's Hall of Fame speech a couple of years ago, and, and he was up there on the podium talking. And he's like, if I spent or tried to spend the time to thank everybody in this sport that gave me an opportunity to allow me to get there, he's like, if one person wasn't there, I don't know if I would be where I am today. And I'm only three or four years into this, and I can relate to that because there are so many people that have given me an opportunity that have allowed me to do this. Um, and mom is probably the number one person in that. So uh, just having the support from your family and knowing that, that they want this for you just as much as you do is very, um, very humbling experience. So how does an up and coming race car driver get sponsorships? Do they come to you? Do you have to go to a certain place where they all are? I mean, how does that, do you reach out? Who makes the initial contact and how does that partnership come together? Right. I think it's a little bit through everything. It's putting yourself in the right scenarios, going to the right events. Um, a huge thing is, is being able to not be afraid to reach out. You're never going to know if you don't reach out. So sponsors don't come to you. You're going to have to make the phone calls, the emails and, and somebody like me who, um, doesn't necessarily have the financial backing to go race at the top levels on the, on the experience. We have to go out and, and talk to companies and brands and, and really show them a different side and approach it different than a lot of other people and show that our story is different. So I think it's trying to find a niche nowadays of what separates you from the hundred other late model drivers out there that are trying to make this a career in, in the NASCAR world. So that's what we worked with Orion Strategies and, and a lot of people on is, is trying to build a brand and build a story that is different and, and wants to get a company excited to come out and help us and show that, you know, we're going to represent their brand and company at the best and the most exciting level we can and showing that us as a brand is different than anybody else out there. So how long do sponsorships normally last? Is that a full career experience or is it a year or two years? I mean, what is the normal contract for a sponsorship? Typically, you'll see a sponsor come in for a race or two, and then you'll you'll see you'll try to get them to like it. Um, you you look at brands like so. Jeff Gordon was my idol growing up, and he had Dupont, which then later became Exalta, and they stuck with him from 1992, I want to say, till 2015 when he retired. So there are brands out there that that stick with a driver for their whole career, and there's brands that come on for one race, and they're like, you know what, this this was fun, but it's just not for us. So it's, it's just trying to find the right company and the balance of somebody that likes racing that wants to be involved in the sport. You look at somebody like Johnny Morris of Bass Pro Shops and they've been involved as long as I've watched, watched the sport and they help multiple drivers out. So it, it's, it's all about trying to find a company and a brand that, that likes you, that likes your story, that wants to be with you through all this and, and thoroughly enjoys the sport of racing as well. 
So what will brands who do want to get into this market look for from a racer? Is it statistics? Is it engagement? I think it's different on every brand. Um, you want So every company wants to know pretty much what am I going to get out of it? And, and there's a ton that a company can get out of it. And I can spend an hour talking on that um, just alone. But they basically are going to look at who you are as a person. Or do you represent yourself well? Do you represent your community? Do you represent the sport well? And then they're also going to look at the social media statistics, uh, their brand, are, are they getting enough recognition out of it? Um, it basically comes down to what that CEO or CEO is looking for out of it. And everyone's different on that aspect. So let's then move on to 2020 when you signed with a different company and have been with them ever since. I mean, how did that move happen? Um, it, it's just going out and meeting people and having, having like building those relationships. I think the huge thing to a huge component to sponsorship and having people invest in you and is basically trying to get them to invest in you. You know, you don't want, obviously they want to invest in the sport, but really when you're investing in racing, you're investing in the person. So trying to show them that you're going to represent them the most. And I, I think we do a good job of really marketing um, ourselves, being involved in a community. Like we just partnered up with the boys and girls club. And in doing so, every lap we run, a sponsored lap, we kick five dollars back to the Boys and Girls Club, and it's showing that you know we're we're willing to give back to the community, we're willing to do outreach or whatever they want. So, building those relationships is a huge factor. Um, you, you look at drivers like Eric Almarola, who has really built a very good brand with Smithfield, and they, and they've stuck with him wherever he's gone throughout his career, and it's because the company really likes who he is a per, as a person. So, it's it's building that camaraderie and really trying to just make those relationships and friendships and then it makes the racing a lot more fun and it makes the partnership a lot more fun. So let's talk about the racing that you do. I mean, how does late model racing differ from what you would normally see on a larger scale? Right. So for somebody like me who doesn't have a lot of experience, it kind of teaches you a host of different skill sets, um, tire management. You know, it's not like a NASCAR race where you get four or five sets of tires throughout a weekend. Typically, you know, of an 150 lap race, it might be one set of tires you get. You might get to come down and change right sides halfway through, depending upon upon that weekend. So it teaches me how to manage my equipment, how to learn the race, because it's something I'm still learning to do is, is how to be around other cars. Like we're fast everywhere we go, it seems like in practice. Um, but building up how to be around other cars, how to set people up to pass, how to do those things. So when we get to the, the NASCAR ranks in the next levels, that it, it it's secondhand nature to be able to do that. So Late model racing is, is a good foundation. It's grassroots racing. It's something that's very important to the sport because everybody pretty much, you know, that's come through the sport has done some sort of grassroots racing, whether it's, it's dirt racing, late models, go-karts, you know, they're, they're involved in our community tracks and everything. And, and those tracks struggle now. They, they get fan bases and everything. You see a lot of these tracks closing down and it's pretty sad, but these are the roots and, and the foundations of what build what you see on TV. So anything we can do to help local tracks or whatever get out there you know but you know you see these tracks try to bring in the bigger drivers and stuff to try to build that brand and everything but it, it's just a community you see a lot of the same people at these tracks and it just helps you get ready for the next level so would you say in the same way that minor league baseball prepares you for the big leagues late model racing prepares you for larger scale nascar I think there's a very um, similar aspect to that. Yes, I think late model racing is very close to that. It teaches you like baseball from the college level. Like there, there are levels that you teach or you learn, like when you're playing guys, like you can see who's going to be in the big leagues and who's not. You see who's got talent and who doesn't. And it kind of does the same thing. And, it, and if you can go out there and impress yourself against a guy that's going to be a fifth round draft pick or some somebody who you know is going to go to the big leagues it gets eyes on you and it's the same kind of level of doing the same thing at the late model level is you know if you can go head to head with the best drivers on the short track circuit then it kind of shows you can do the same at the at the next level for sure so can you talk a little bit about the mental performance component of racing yeah so I I believe I'm a personal believer in that the mental aspect and anything you do in life is very important um whatever you do to set your day up, like if it's starting by making your bed in the morning, whatever it might be, that's a huge component in the being mentally ready to take on the day. So whenever we're going into a late model race, I do whatever I can to prepare, watch film, lean on my teammates, lean on my crew chief and everything on, on what we can do. And then I sit back a night before and 
there's a couple of books I've read on talking about breathing techniques and, and mentally preparing, like mentally visualizing yourself doing something before you do it. So I'll take 30 minutes before the night before whatever and sit there and close my eyes and just think about what I'm going to do, how to prepare for it. If I'm in this situation, what, you know, how to operate around it or work around it. And I think those are huge aspects that any athlete or anybody should do because it's mentally, there's a huge component in any sport of it. I, I think it was Yogi Bear who said baseball is 90% mental and 10% skill. And I think that's pretty much any sport. You have to be mentally ready and prepared for any anything that's thrown at you because not everything's going to go your way like we talked about earlier. And it's what can you do in those scenarios to make it better? So is there any kind of psychology individual that is helping you guys early on? Or does that does that differ from racer to racer? So there are people in, in the industry that do that. I haven't really worked with anybody within the racing world on that, but I do listen to a lot of motivational speaking and a lot of people who talk about stuff like that. I, I try to follow stories of the best athletes. So I really study athletes like Tom Brady, like Derek Jeter, um, listen to the stories of Jeff Gordon and those guys on what they did that separated them. Because if you look at athletes to me in any aspect, like there are athletes that could have been Tom Ray. There are athletes that could have been Derek Jeter, but they had all the skill, but they didn't do the right things to prepare to, to be the, like Tom Brady or any of those guys. So what separates them is well, I really try to dive into their stories and see what they do that makes them different and what separates them from the field. And that's something I think is a huge component of anything is trying to find, if you want to be the greatest, like watching what people do to be great. What do the greats do? And if you can learn and try to figure out, obviously they're not going to tell you all their secrets because that's what makes them great. But if you can learn and watch and analyze them, I think that helps a lot in, in whatever you're trying to do. So what, let's talk, you were talking half an hour the night before. So now it's race day. Can you walk me through what precedes you getting in the car? Yeah. So on a typical late model weekend, we'll try to show up to the racetrack in the morning. We'll get some, they'll have like a couple hours for, we call it testing, which is practice. So we'll, we'll go out there and Bruce and, and the guys in the shop will roll the car off and, and we'll go out there and just try to, they take me to a different track pretty much every time. So basically I'll go out there for my first run and just try to learn the track, try to find my break points, throttle points, where I should be at, get, get a good basis and we'll pull back in. We'll debrief on it for five, 10 minutes, let the car cool down. And then we'll go into, okay, we're going to go out here and try to run a little bit quicker here, or we need to back you down a little bit. And then we'll go into, okay, we need to change springs or, or make a wedge adjustment or whatever that might be on the car to make the car either. When we talk loose, that means the car is out of control. When we say the car is tight, that means the car won't turn. So those are two of the big guidelines that I can give feedback to, to the race team. Like, okay, the car's turning too well. I need you to stop the car from turning too much because I can't get the throttle down or I need the car to turn more so I can get the throttle down harder and sooner exiting each end of the racetrack. So after we roll out of that, there'll typically be some downtime. We'll grab some lunch and then they have the track will set aside like about a two hour period where it's 15 minute intervals of rotating practice. So it'll be like four or five divisions there. So each car each, or each division will go out and get 15 minutes and then we'll go, get a baseline off of that. And then typically we'll run into qualifying. Qualifying is where you'll take the nose off, cool the car down as much as possible. And you basically make a bonsai run. It's two laps as hard as you can go. And that's going to set your, where you start for tonight on, on the racetrack. So the fastest guy qualifies first and then on down. And some of these tracks invert. So then they'll take the, they'll let a fan pull a, a ball out of a hat or, or a piece of paper out of a hat. And if it says six and the sixth place car will start first and the first place car will start six. And they'll do that to make it interesting because the fastest car will have to drive through the field and come to the front. Um, so typically after qualifying the national anthem, the prayer, and then it's whatever we line up for the division. So we might race first, we might race fourth. So it changes on how you mentally prepare for that event, because if you race first and it's like you're going right into it, if you're racing like fourth that night, it might be two hours before you get into the race car and race. So it's trying to find out what to do in that, in that downtime to stay prepared, to stay focused, to get ready to the race car and go compete. So what you can't do is have an anxiety attack. Absolutely. <laughs> How do you stop that from happening? I, I honestly so much is on the line every single race. Right. So I had a coach that was at UMES. His name was coach West and, and he really, pounded in our head to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So that's something I've really tried to take into the racing world because I've been uncomfortable a lot because I, I don't, I've not done this my whole life. So 
the first year I really struggled with being uncomfortable. And then I called him up and we've had a lot of conversations on this stuff. And it's like, dude, you just got to start being comfortable, with not being comfortable. And that's I, something I just remind myself, like, it's okay. We're going to be all right. And we're going to stick to our game plan, whatever that might be for tonight and, and go apply it to the race. So just trying to keep reiterating that to myself and that keeps me calm and, and ready to go. Have you ever experienced anxiety or panic while you were racing? Not in the race car. Okay. I would say I've experienced um, anxiety on trying to find sponsors and stuff along those lines, but that's what we do when we get in the race car. So it's, it's basically like once that green flag drops, the only thing you have time to focus on is hitting your marks, hitting your spots and doing what you're supposed to do. Because if you don't, then you're going to find the wall pretty quick. So if you're not mentally focused or hundred percent there, then things can get ugly pretty quick. So let's talk about focus. How do you fine tune that part of your game? Um, basically going in the race car, I, I just, we have a game plan and, and my crew chief will tell me what that game plan is before the race. If it's a new track, we'll basically set aside. Okay. Our goals for tonight are go run all the laps, keep the car clean and let's stay on the lead lap. And then when we come back to this racetrack, we'll go try to compete for a top 10. And then the next time we'll try to compete for a top five. And then hopefully the third or fourth time we're back there, we're up there fighting for a win or battling up front. And that's basically just knowing what a game plan is for the weekend, how to approach it, how to, how to execute. And then we go from there. So that's pretty much where the focus is, is like, okay, I know what my job is. I know what I have to do. And that keeps me more focused than anything. So am I right to kind of assume a parallel between being a pitcher and driving a race car in terms of individual functioning? I would say, yeah. So I, I think you see a lot of it in racing because if you turn on a, on a NASCAR race on any given weekend and you watch these pit crews go to work, all these guys are former Division One athletes for the most part. They go recruit football players, baseball players, whatever sport they might have come from, somebody who wasn't going to go pro but was very close to doing so. And the reason they've done that is because of the mental aspect and the physical aspect of playing a top-end sport. And they can teach these guys how to do pit stops at the top level. And it's a very – very crucial part of the sport because it's a team sport. So if you have a slow pit stop and you lose five spots on the last restart, the chances of winning that race are very slim. If there's 10 laps to go and you lose five spots off the end of pit road, then you're probably not going to win the race. So I think you see a lot of racers and a lot of race teams and organizations go try to find athletes because of what athletes bring to the table. There's not a lot of that in racing. So I, I can think of only a couple that are in the sport right now that were former college athletes, but I think that they are, just as prepared as anybody else has raced their whole life because they, they've been through the ringer. They know what it's like to compete at a top level. That's interesting <clears throat> because when you look at a race like the Indy 500, for example, right, things are so fine-tuned and you never really think about how that pit crew got to be there. I mean, yeah. what brings that group of people together? I think there's a, it's the same aspect of being on a team. Like the guys that we see at the race shop that I see every day, I've, I've become good friends with them and it's because we're, we're together a lot. So I think it's whether you look at anybody from, you talk, you listen to like former Navy SEAL squads or, or anything else, when you're with people that much, and you're, you learn to lean on those people, you learn to, to trust those people and being around them. So I think that is the same as any other thing in life or team or work environment. I'm sure if you work with the same amount of people all the time, you build camaraderie with them and you trust them and it, it's a lot easier to do your job. So I think there's the same aspect in that as sports, um, racing, whatever it might be, is that if you have a core amount of people or a group of people around you, that it, it allows you to focus and be better at what you do because you trust the people around you. So they know what you expect from them. What are they in turn expecting <clears throat> from you? to do my job that the basically, you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, the levels that we're getting ready to go to and the levels that we do this stuff at it's, they expect me to be ready, be prepared, um, and just go do what we're supposed to do. And that's really what it, the simple way to answer. It. So what is the difference between training styles? I mean, how much are you training your physical health versus your mental health? Right. So I, I do a lot more weight, weight style training, weightlifting. I, I work with a CrossFit gym down here and I do more personalized training for me. Um, but you see a lot of these drivers, they do long bike rides or a lot of cardio work because inside of a race car at, at the peak of any racing, you get it to be 120, 130 degrees inside of a race car. 
So I tell people all the time to tell drivers that they're not athletes that try doing a full workout in a, a hot sauna. And that's pretty much what it, what it's like for three hours or whatever the, the duration of that race is. It's very excruciating. It's very, it, it wears you down mentally, physically, and every aspect of it. So there, there's a huge component in being physically fit and ready and having the mental toughness to do it just as much as any other sport. So you, they, one interesting thing that NASCAR has been doing has been putting heart rate monitors on the drivers the last couple of weeks. And it's very, very cool to watch. They, they've been showing somebody like Denny Hamlin, his heart rate stays around 90 beats per minute, which is pretty, pretty insane to be going 190 miles an hour racetrack and keep your heart rate that low. And they, they show other drivers and theirs are around 140. So they, they talked to Denny. I was listening to the broadcast last night and he basically reiterated that he's been studying the data and showing that he believes if he can keep his heart rate down throughout the race, that it allows him to be more mentally sharp and, and prepared towards the end of the race versus some other drivers on the racetrack. So those are all aspects of the data and everything. The, the, the data that teams get back now is insane on, on where they can show you on everything that's happening with the race car versus what you're doing in the race car. It's pretty crazy. So I think that's wow. a huge part of being physically ready. So where do you see the technology of the racing industry going? Because the heart rate monitors are very impressive in terms of the data that they can give. What else do you <clears throat> see changing? There's a lot of things. So like basically at the top levels now, like they can hook a computer up to the race car and throughout the race, they can show where the leader is getting back in the throttle, where he's hitting the brake and how he's able to, if you're running 15th, show the data on where, okay, he's in the throttle, a car length quicker than you are. And he's able to carry his speed for this much longer down the back stretch or the front stretch. The, the technology, I think there was a huge swing back in the nineties where they went from teams of people who just worked on race cars. So now where you see every crew chief in the sport now is basically an engineer from a, a top university. And it's taking that technology that they go to the wind tunnel and, and dyno and basically being able to look at this, the data on a computer and show where that race car needs to be at. And they can adjust on that race car and make that happen. So technology has become a huge aspect of the sport um, for pit stops, every, every aspect of racing, you see it becoming more and more techno technologically involved. So, it's having to be able to, it's not just showing up and driving a race car. It's being able to study data, get in the simulator and put the time in on the simulator and all these things add up to performance on the racetrack. So how do you stay focused um, for it, the extended period of time that you have to? I think the adrenaline you have in the race car and, and everything that's going on, you don't have time to think. And I think when you can take things out and, and not really think about things, that's where you see, you listen to the greatest athletes and they talk, the more you think about things, the more it kind of messes you up. So I think in racing, you have to just go. There's really no time to sit there and think about what's going on or happening around you. you you're in the moment and it's something that forces you just to be in that moment. You know, it, it, there's really not a lot of time to, to second guess or to, you know, cross yourself up on what you're doing. You just have to do it. Is that freeing or does that bring in more anxiety? I think that's the most exciting part about doing or, or racing is, is you just feel alive. Like when you're on the pace laps and everything, I, I think that's where your anxiety might hit more than anything. Cause you know, like that adrenaline is going, it's like, okay, we're about to, to sail it off in a corner here at hundred miles an hour side by side. Once that happens, that's all out the window. It, it's pretty much just go. And then the last thing you're thinking about is being worried about being side by side or, or sideways around somebody. It, it's just doing what you're supposed to do. So what is the scariest moment that you have either seen or experienced firsthand in racing? So the 2020 Daytona 500 was the scariest thing I think I've ever witnessed. It was a uh, Ryan Newman's crash. Um, it was a very brutal crash. He had, he was 200 yards away from winning the Daytona 500 and on restrictor plate, restrictor plate racing, like the only way to really stay up front and, and keep control of a race is to throw some heavy blocks. So, you know, he was getting pushed to the checkered flag and he got turned sideways and got turned around in front of 40 cars coming toward. Him. So he hit the wall and, and the car went airborne. And, and when it went airborne, it came down driver's side window and he got hit right in the driver's side window. And you saw the whole chassis of the race car bend and that moment um, of seeing all the safety crew around him and seeing tarps go up around the race car, it was like, I don't know if he, he survived that wreck. And the modern t technology of how well NASCAR's implemented safety and everything allowed him to walk away from it. He walked away with, I believe, just a concussion, some bruises, but it knocked him out. But 
you know, 20 years ago, I can't say that we would have saw him walk out of that race car. So that was very scary, but you, it's something drivers don't think about. You know, you don't really think about getting hurt. You don't think about the consequences of what happens. You know, you, you know what can happen, but you don't really think about it. So thank God NASCAR's built safe race cars and, and they allow us to have a, a safe office to work in and in, in the best terms. But um, it, it's just very, very, very protected now. So a safe office to work in. Yep. I think that's the best way to word it. Yeah. I like that. So what can we look for in 2021 from you? I'm hoping we're going to have a pretty big announcement, I believe this week. And once we make that announcement, I'm hoping that springs us into 2022 and the, the remainder of 2021 season. I know we have some things locked down that I'm really excited to share, but once it goes um, public, I, I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. But I, I think it's going to give us an opportunity to finally chase a dream at a level we want to do it. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you wanted to ask me or something that you feel like I've missed about your story? I think that's pretty accurate. I, I think the, the thing I'll hit on is, you know, we talked about the people, but you know, give a couple of people a shout out, you know, Coach West and, and Coach O'Neill and Coach Shives, like those guys, I think those three guys alone were very huge in my career in, in baseball and in the racing world too, because I still reach out to those guys and talk to them and, and lean on them. And I really think us as a team came together very well in the 2017 season because of those guys and, and the friendships I made because of them and, and the learning the mental side and, and physical preparation and nutrition side and everything. I think those guys really implemented a, a strong base in me. So I really just have extreme gratitude to those guys for allowing me to, or to build me up the way they did. So let's talk a little bit about the longevity of a driver. How long is that career on average? It's different. So back in the nineties, we really saw like an, an older generation and I call them old, but it's not old that you're talking 40 year old guys driving race cars or getting their break in their late thirties. And to where we saw, I think Jeff Gordon really changed the sport. He came in as a 20 year old and, and took the sport by fire and, and every owner was looking for the next Jeff Gordon. And for a 20 year career, we, we see drivers from 20 years old now race till they're 44, 45 years old. So that's a possibility for somebody like me at 26. I don't really know where it'll be. It, it really relies on funding and the, the ability to do your job at the best you can do it. Um, but you see drivers around the sport for three, four five years. And then you see drivers around for 20 years. It really just depends on a lot of aspects between funding, performance, what you're doing on and off the racetrack to represent your brand and the company. Um, there, there's just a lot of different aspects that go into it, but there's drivers now that are, are 17 years old, 18 years old, competing in one of the top three series in NASCAR. And then if you go down to late model ranks, like you can race against guys that are 14, 15 years old. And it's just a very different, um, it's different for everybody, I would say. So how do you feel like you have fit into this race car environment? Because you <clears throat> didn't particularly start early on. Right. I think what's different for me is that I'm still meeting new people and still learning people in the industry. Um, obviously, I didn't build those 20 year relationships from the time I was four years old till 24 or 23 when I started. But I think I, I'm starting to learn the, what I need to do to, to really fit in. But for me, fitting in and I'm trying to find the best way to word it, I want to fit in. But the part of me as a competitor, you know, doesn't want to become best friends with everybody on the racetrack because you're competing with them every week. So, I think you see a lot of these guys that get too friendly with guys nowadays and it affects their performance on the racetrack on how they race people and how they, they are, might be a little too worried to rough somebody up that that's their friend, you know? So I think there's an aspect of keeping friendships, but also understanding that come down to crunch time that all friendships go out the window. And then I was looking at your website and you had discussed <clears throat> battling dyslexia, but mm -hmm. that racing was a whole bunch of left turns. <laughs> and I just thought that that was, that was so interesting, the way that you had just so eloquently put that. Right. Has that made it easier or more difficult to excel? I think dyslexia affects racing in a different aspect for me. It affects 
the way I'm able to like, so sending emails, I have to really be focused on how I'm typing things out because I, I do get crossed up on my words sometimes and, and the way my spelling comes out. So on the professional side, on, on being able to put a report together or, or put together a sponsorship package, I think that's what it affects the most. Um, from the racing side, I don't really know if there's too much of an aspect in the race car, but it, it's more on the professional side of sending emails and being involved with people through text or group chats or, or whatever it might be. That's really where it affects me the most, I would say. And then how many people are you working with throughout a week? Would you <laughs> guess? I would say at least 20. And then I, I think the higher up we go and, and the more we you know, are able to reach into the bigger ranks of the racing world, I think that just continues to grow. It's definitely something that I've learned to work with because the amount of emails, the phone calls on one sponsor deal, I mean, it's, it's insane on how many calls and emails going to closing a deal. And I didn't realize that going into what we were about to do, but it's a huge component of, of like I said, building the relationships and building foundations and, and staying in contact. So, and then anywhere from the race shop and being involved with our, our team, we have five guys in the shop all the time that I'm around all of every, just about every day. So. See, it's those guys, the, the people that work with me for, for Orion, the sponsors, my mom, you know, who's a big part in helping me find sponsors. It's a lot of people that you talk to and interact with throughout a week to make it all come together. So it's a very interesting deal because it's not just a, a race team. It's not just a, a sponsor. It's, it's having it all intertwined and working together. So to have everything moving in the same motion, it, it's, it takes a lot to keep that all together. So how many sponsors do you have at a time? Is it just one or are there four, five, six, 12? Right. So basically the way teams lay it out is there's at the top level, there's 36 races. We might lay out for next year, 15 races at the top level and then late model race, 10 or 15. So when we go to a sponsor, we'll say, okay, here's what we have on the table. Here's what we're able to do. Are you guys interested in, in covering these races? And, and they'll come to us with, okay, we're going to give you X amount of dollars and we'll plan that out on what races they want to be local marketed to, to their company or where they want to be at. And then I'll go to my race owner and we'll, we'll put together those races. And if there's 10 or five or whatever left, then we'll go try to find another sponsor that's willing to cover those races. So you can have one sponsor that covers everything, or you can have 10 different sponsors to cover 10 different races and then smaller scale sponsors to cover some of the late model stuff. So you can have one primary sponsor or you can end up having 15. It just comes down to what the funding is and what level they're wanting to go um, race at. So you, you mentioned earlier mindfulness and experiences that you go through pre-race that completely mm -hmm. calm you down. <clears throat> Can you work through how you, how you do those things ahead of time? Yeah, so I spoke a little bit about like the preparation the night before, like watching some film visualizing yourself in the race car, doing what you're trying to accomplish for that, that next day. Breathing techniques are a huge thing. I've learned to kind of slow my heart rate down. Like before qualifying, I probably am the most anxious because that's probably the hardest thing in a weekend to do is to go on cold tires and just leave pit road and get up to speed and just get after it as hard as you can go for two laps. You're out of control. And it's all about hitting your marks to a T to, to be able to put a good lap time down. You get two laps and there's not a lot of room for error in those two laps. So breathing techniques on like counting down, like one of the sports psychology books, I can't remember the title of it right now. I wish I could, but um, it's a guy that basically talks to all the top athletes and everything on, on what they did to help them. A Rob Ken Griffey Jr. He worked with a ton, host of, host of big time names on what he did to help them. But it was uh, basically, I used a breathing technique of slowing my breath down and counting. So I'll count that for three, two, one, when I exhale, take a deep breath and do the same thing. So I think that really helps calm me down a little bit pre-qualifying. Um, but that's really just about all I do from that aspect in, in a race weekend because everything happens so fast and you really don't have too much time to think after that. That's crazy. And is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or mm -hmm. you wanted to include on this podcast that we haven't talked about yet? Because we are um, winding down our question. Absolutely. So I, I think um, routine, building a routine in a, in a daily process, um, even if it's not a race weekend, keeping the same routine is a huge thing for me. Um, I try to follow a routine every single day on what I do. So basically, I'll get up and make my bed every morning. I'll eat pretty much the same thing for breakfast. I'll get up and I'll make my phone calls or, or sponsor calls or emails or whatever is set for that morning. Show up to the race shop, 
put some time in at the race shop, um, get try to help the guys get the car ready for wherever we're going to race, and then hitting the gym and then winding down for the afternoon. So it, it's hard to keep a routine on race weekend because every race, race weekend is different in its own way. But I really think there is a foundation in building a routine and, and keeping and following the same routine that helps prepare you for anything in life. So I really am a big firm believer in keeping a strong routine. So is there anything or any point in your career that you can imagine working mm-hmm. one-on-one with some kind of mental performance consultant? Or do you think that I, you're, you're working through that learning process now by yourself? Right. So I, I think yes, um, in the future, absolutely. As we get to higher ranks and as things come together, then yes, I think that's a huge part that I would want to get involved in. I, I think uh, anybody that you can help that can help you on a mental aspect or, or work towards making you more prepared for a weekend is just a beneficial factor for, for that weekend. So um, any performance enhancer I can do then that's going to allow me to be more ready, I think, yes, that's something I would definitely look at doing. So do you ever talk with fellow racers about the mental side or is that kind of like where you draw the line? <laughs> I have never had a mental talk with what, what goes into the mental preparedness for another driver. When we're at the racetrack, it's more talking about, okay, how's your car? What's your car doing? Like my teammate, Amber, whenever she gets out of the car and she's quicker than me, or, or we might be a little quicker or like, we always have a debrief. Okay. What's your car doing? What's my car doing? And it's basically leaning off each other on what we can do to make those cars as equal as possible and as fast as possible for the race. So, and then, then there's just a lot of downtime. Normally racers that I've learned really don't talk about racing too much when you're at the racetrack. You're talking about what's going on around you or, or, you know, you're laughing, joking around, trying to stay loose for the event. So um, I think it's more, we'll debrief and then it's kind of everybody for themselves after, after everybody's all squared away. So when you, in the event that you do win a race, what's the next step? So winning, winning the race would be, um, we, we had an opportunity and I, I still kick myself. It was the 2020 speed weeks that we should have won a race and I made a rookie mistake. Um, and that's just from a lack of experience and it still haunts me a little bit, but I know hopefully I'll never make that mistake again, but I, uh, I really think that's just going to propel us more forward in sponsorship talks and everything showing that we're able to compete and, and win at this level. So what's it going to take to go to the next level? So I think once we cross those bridges and once we start, knocking off consistent top fives and and more consistent runs that it opens the door for more sponsorship and more opportunities going forward. And I think that that is the end of our questioning. Awesome. So I think that your episode will come out in four weeks. Okay. So just about a month from this week. Sounds great. And can you send me or have Matt send me a, a picture of you that I can use for social, for social media, please. Absolutely. It can Absolutely. either be a headshot of you or you in the race car or just you in the for zone. Sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah, I will have Matt, I'll have Matt send it over and just thank you for having me on. I do appreciate it. Any chance we get to share our story or, or tell what we're doing, I, you know, I greatly appreciate having that opportunity. So yeah. Thank you. thank you for coming on. I'm so glad yeah. that that Matt put this together and I'm excited Absolutely. to put your story together as well. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And then I'll reach out um, once this episode is live. If you can just use social media to promote it, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. We'll share it on Facebook, Instagram, and probably on the website and Twitter as well. So Perfect. as soon as that's done, I'll have Matt reach out and let you know it's been shared on everything. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Have, awesome. a great, Thank you. have a great rest of your day. And I will look forward to that picture. And then once this episode is live, I'll get back to you. Yep. And I know it's Labor Day, so I appreciate you taking the time on an off day and everything to do it. So, no problem. Have a great you. rest of your day. Yep. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.